So we're very lucky today. We have Dominique um, Ussolini. Dominic Uccellini. Uccellini. Yeah. Okay, I should have practiced before. Um, he is the owner of Alluvian Aeroponics, which uh, designed and operates a 4,000 square foot controlled environment agriculture facility in Baltimore City. Thank you for being with us. Um, then we also have uh, Dr. Ching Tien, uh, oh. who's here with us from the Maryland Department of the Environment. Um, and then we also have with us at the end of the table, Margaret Morgan Hubbard, who is the founder and CEO of Eco City Farms. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm just gonna give each panelist, take three, around three to five minutes to give some more details about yourself and your connection with the view nexus. All right. Hello, I'm Dominic uh, Uccellini. I, um... I operate a, a vertical farm in Baltimore City. Uh, we are an aeroponics facility. Um, I started this thing around five years ago, or actually seven years ago, sort of just experimenting um, in the basement, really. Uh, I saw some some YouTube videos and was very intrigued with the whole concept of controlled environment agriculture and the idea of uh, sort of the, the, the future of, of farming. Now, whether it'll, It'll be the future is another question, but it's a, it's a very interesting um, problem to approach. Um, so, you know, experimented for a couple of years, uh, moved to a larger facility uh, in Baltimore City with uh, the help of um, this a group called Be More Ag, a nice grant. And we uh, experimented there for a couple of years until I moved to a 4,000 square foot um, facility and where we're producing Mostly lettuces. Uh, we do some herbs and microgreens. Um, uh, everything is a uh, is proprietary, so we built the the whole system from the ground up. Um, we stack horizontal levels of uh, of, of foliage of of of, uh, of lettuce uh, up to eighteen feet in the air. So we haven't quite gotten to the top yet. We're, we're currently at around fourteen feet. So five of seven levels. Um, we use we use lifts and ladders to pull all the all the lettuce off and uh, harvest package. We sell mostly to uh, restaurants in Baltimore and DC. I, I, we go through aggregator an aggregator who sells to forty or fifty of the top restaurants in the area. Um, also to local grocery stores and farmers markets all over all over the region. We do the closest one to here is uh, a Tacoma Park one we do on Sundays now. You can find us there. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and so I was just talking um, over there. So right now we're just doing uh, lettuce and, 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 and greens. Uh, it'd be my goal to one day do more vegetables and other things like tomatoes and cucumbers, which I have experimented with. I don't know the commercial capacity of that. So we haven't really had the opportunity to expand on that, but that's sort of what excites me about it. I would like to go a little further than, than um, than just uh, lettuce, even though just lettuce. Just, uh, so, and that's essentially it. We do uh, we do about five thousand heads a, a month, and uh, yeah, looking to grow. So. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Ching Ten. I'm uh, from Maryland Department of the Environment. Uh, my career with the uh, Department of the Environment uh, divide into two portions. Uh, the first portion is a full-time employee. I retired in 2021 after my 45 year service with uh, MPE. Uh, and about one and a half years ago, I went back to the same agency uh, as a contractual employee. Uh, my contractual employees uh, uh, function with the department, uh, deal with uh, water reuse, especially in portable water, uh, indirect portable water reuse. In other words, uh, using treated wastewater, treated to very high quality, and that can be used as a drinking water source, uh, either put back to the reservoir or inject into groundwater, uh, use another source of drinking water. So that I'm um, working that kind of project right now. It's interesting related to water. Uh, before my retirement, I worked many projects uh, related to uh, 
agricultural irrigation and treated wastewater. Uh, so we're talking about fuel, uh, food, energy, uh, and, uh, and water. Those three are on the apex of triangle. I most of the time I'm working related to water and food. Uh, in my career with MDE, uh, I had to uh, review uh, 45 projects uh, using uh, treated wastewater to irrigate either on the golf course or agricultural uh, farm. Uh, one uh, particular project uh, is pretty much related to food, energy, and water. And I will take a few minutes to uh, introduce our project to you. That project is located in uh, Center Bureau, Center Bureau, Maryland, and I prepared a uh, prepare a, a, a brief uh, introduction uh, for that project. Uh, so you can uh, take a look at about the detail. Uh, the town of Center Bureau. Okay, the town of Center Bureau is located in uh, Maryland Eastern Shore, uh, which is about. 4,500 population. Uh, the wastewater from the, uh, the town uh, on the average about half million gallon per day. They treat it in the uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, by the uh, 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 active research process and then using the cartridge filter and then use a chlorine and UV disinfect and the effluent in the growing season, uh, using the pump, pump three miles away, go to a spray field. The spray field is about 100 acres, and it's agricultural uh, land. Uh, they grow either the corn or the soybean. Uh, the, uh, in 2022, uh, there, uh, there were three million gallons of treated wastewater irrigated on the corn field. And the corn field produce about uh, 200 bushel per acre per season uh, of the corn. So you know, for 100 acre, uh, they have about 20,000 uh, bushel produced in one year. So that's food and the wastewater part, uh, roughly about 3 million gallon treated wastewater irrigate on the farm. At the same time, uh, on the spray field, they have 6.5 acre of the uh, solar panel. That solar panel can produce uh, 1,350 megawatt uh, hour uh, per year. So one megawatt equal one uh, million watt. That power is adequate to provide the power to irrigate uh, electricity to to power the center pivot, irrigate the, the farm. And besides that, uh, the power company also send a check every year about 3,000 to 4,000 back to the town. So you can see the benefit. Uh, we have water, uh, which instead of going to the river, we use to irrigate the crop. Benefit produce corn, and on the same time, the energy produced. So the system is self-sufficient. Uh, also, the, the town have additional income. So this is just a win-win situation. So that's my project description. Thank you. Hi, my name is Margaret Morgan Hubbard, and I'm the CEO and founder of EcoCity Farms. EcoCity Farms is a nonprofit urban teaching and learning farm in Prince George's County that grows great food farms and farmers in ways that protect, restore, and sustain the natural environment, <clears throat> excuse me, and the health of local communities. Growing with air, working with area children, youth and adults, eco educates and trains the next generation of urban farmers, eaters and environmental activists. Um, I, when I started eco, um, it I had just left nine years of working at the University of Maryland here in College Park. And I was um, director of something called the Engaged University, where I tried to find ways to engage the local, local communities in the life of the university. I found that many people at the university knew much, much more about 
um, everywhere else in the world about Sri Lanka. If there were if there were events that talked about what was happening in the world, people and development of any country, people would come to that in droves. But when there was any discussion about Prince George's County, many people weren't even aware that they lived in Prince George's County, that this university was in Prince George's County. So I actually um, worked with Maryland National Capital Park and Planning to organize tours of Prince George's County for faculty and students of the university. And when I left the university, I started an urban farm in Prince George's County because I had learned so much about its needs, but also because Prince George's County um, at that time divided itself into three tiers. It had the rural tier that was still farm, largely farms, it had the suburban tier that was mainly wealthy homes, and it had what they called the urban tier, which is where we are now. And one of the things that I know also noticed is that farmland and or potential farmland was being um, bought up at tremendous rates. And there are many, many new housing communities were called farms, but they actually had nothing to do with growing food. And I was very alarmed about the consequences of not having healthy food grown everywhere we can grow food. I mean, the one thing I think is critical about um, dealing with climate change is to have many, many small redundant systems. And so that if one thing is knocked out, like the uh, many of the farms in Vermont and um, California of late through due to fires and other disasters, there are other places that can take up having healthy food available for people. So um, we consider ourselves solutionaries. Um, that's a term that was used by Grace Lee Boggs, um, who at the end of her life, after being having years of being a civil rights activist, actually started an urban farm herself in her 90s in Detroit. Um, one of the interesting things about Eco City Farms at this time is that every year for the last 10 years, we have had um, fellows from all over the world who have come to learn about urban farming. And we have gone, um, staff of Eco have gone to various countries, Zambia, Ghana, Malaysia, Indonesia, Jamaica, um, Papua New Guinea and Macedonia are places where we have worked with people to try to figure out how to implement farming in ways that conserve water and energy and produce food. One of the critical parts of um, our farms, we now have 16 acres under production in um, at three different sites in Prince George's County. We own none of that land. It is all owned by others and we, we farm it. Our most recent farm is an incubator farm. We train 30 beginning farmers each year. Um, and most of them live within five miles of our farm. When we started working, people came from all over the country to work with us. We wanted to be hyper local and we were not. We are now hyper local and the um, people we train are largely um, women of color um, who are very interested in being farmers. And many have advanced degrees of all kinds, but are very, very concerned about their health and the health of their communities. The community we farm in is a low income, low food access community. And one of the critical things is that we feel that it's very important to supply food, healthy food to people who do not otherwise have access to that food. So the, the major principles that we adhere to is to um, improve soils, to um, conserve water, to create our own energy, to use recycled and abandoned materials as much as possible and repurpose them for, for community building, 
and to um, make sure that everybody has a healthy food future. Um, so, so the format for the rest of our conversation will be, I have a few questions that I'll use just to spark some conversation, but then I will open it up for the last few minutes so that everyone from the audience can join the conversation. So this is really your chance um, to ask questions that you have of those who are actively involved in the few nexus. So my, fir my first question for you all is a, a big picture question. So what is the biggest challenge facing us that you see in the food, energy, water nexus today? So I'll just go right down the line. Well, the big, huh? Actually, you want, sure. you want to try to pass that? Yeah, I'll probably come back and think about it. You want to think? Okay, um, maybe I can start it uh, as far as the, uh, the food and the water part. I have more subject to uh, uh, to discuss because uh, uh, using the treated wastewater to irrigate on agricultural crop, uh, it's people uh, well question say, are they safe? Uh, so, uh, like for example, this project in Centerville, well, when the project started, the public perception is not too great. In other words, you either get treated wastewater on the, my neighbor, the land, also on the food crop, it, it certainly is not acceptable to them. We hold many public here in the convention to go ahead. So that's, uh, to me, it's an obstacle, but uh, as well as a solar panel, uh, or windmill, uh, if there, uh, you can provide a space for for install those facility. That certainly it's it's a positive. Thanks. Um, each one of these, I think, is highly challenging. So, um, getting and um, having a steady supply of healthy food in a country where very little of our food is actually healthy is a tremendous challenge. I think that we don't, re we are, we have constantly looked for the cheapest solutions in food, whether it's in school, um, in school lunch programs or otherwise, as opposed to what will actually restore our bodies to health. We're interested in producing organic food, um, actually beyond organic, we are certified naturally grown. And um, so food itself, there are tremendous numbers of food insecure people in this country. I would say that that the one of our greatest risks all over the world is ha having and maintaining um, drinkable pu um, water. And um, to produce um, organic food and the kind of food we do, we try very hard to um, reuse everything we can, but it is not within organic standards to use um, recycled water. And so that has to change. Um, we have found many ways to make water healthy and reusable on our farm. We, we um, conserve water in every way we can, but um, we have to be able to change the regulations so that we are actually encouraged to use water over and over again and figure out ways to clean it. So I think that, and then obviously we need energy in that process. And um, we started running our farms on, um, on renewable energy largely because we couldn't access any other form of energy. Um, and if we're going to have food and we're going to, we have to have water and energy. Um, however, we found it very challenging to use renewable energy and solar to keep food cold and to um, maintain the refrigeration that's required because it uses a tremendous amount of energy that just that solar energy is not conducive to producing. And um, so one of the things that we have to do in the energy field is to figure out ways to store what renewable energy we can create. And generally that's with batteries. And so I'd say that um, and, and batteries are both expensive and not up to the task at this stage. So um, 
we needed to do a lot of work and a lot of work quickly to make sure that the um, energy, water, and food supplies um, will continue to feed the world. Yeah, I was just going to sort of add on some of the, my personally, the challenges for me have been um, when you're talking about a smaller scale, these urban farms, like such as myself, has been making the real model economically feasible mm -hmm. next to these giant commercial farms out of California, out of Arizona, wherever, where they're um, getting not only subsidies, but they have just economies of scale and, and they're able to, you know, drive the price so far down that um, it's very difficult for urban farms or small farmers or, or local farms to really um, compete without any sort of uh, uh, local governmental help, basically. Um, so that's sort of been the biggest for me is 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 actually making a feasi economically feasible model without um, without outside help, essentially. So, um, I mean, I'm I'm hearing a lot of the same thing. So it sounds like there's a need for nutritious, safe food, but we also need to be able to do that in a way that's economically feasible and practical. Um, so my my next question is more a little bit about um, the the nitty gritty kind of your day to day. So could you describe for us your typical day and how you deal with the food, energy, water nexus in your day? Maybe Margaret will start with you this time. I would say we don't have anything like a typical day <laughs> at our farm. Um, we have. Um, we, we are not only um, running our farm and trying to produce food, but we are also, um, we train 30 people a year and we have youth programs and so on. And um, I'd say that unfortunately, like most people in the world, our days are controlled by crises of different kinds. And, um, you know, the, the um, someone will show up and say that there's some problem about our water supply, or there's some, or there is, um, you know, ice all over the farm, or a, um, a hoop house was destroyed by a, a storm. Um, there's constantly those kinds of challenges. A, a tip in a typical day. Um, because we grow year round, we have um, farmers on site. One of the interesting challenges of COVID is while everyone learned how to go home and work from a computer, you can't do that when you're a farmer. Um, food doesn't grow by itself. And um, it's a very, very labor intensive activity. And um, so for the first time, we learned that we were in fact essential workers. And um, I'd say that the um, the critical thing about it being about what a day is like is that when you are um, a small operation, as as you mentioned, there's not much money involved. Everything, every challenge becomes both a financial one as well as a, a one a structural one, and. Um, I guess what, one of the things that we try to do is make sure that um, that we're constantly looking at um, solutions that that will work in the future as well as today. Well, so my day um, is pretty, well, since we do the same thing every day, it's essentially a six to seven day a week. I'm an actual farmer now. I guess I started this enjoying designing the whole thing, the whole infrastructure of the vertical farm. But we're a very small operation. There's only four of us, five, including my mom, who have uh, who I've taken on basically as a part time worker. Um, so we're I'm literally harvesting every day, planting every day, cleaning every day. Um, it's 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 a lot. Um, so I'm a farmer, I guess, <laughs> a new age indoor farmer. Uh, so that's essentially it, rolling my sleeves up and getting covered in roots and algae, basically. So. 
So my office time with the uh, Maryland Department and Environment, MD, the, I would say 90% time is allocated related to water. We wanna make sure the water uh, reuse, they can meet the water quality criteria. It's safe for the public to use. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we have a class four reclaim water, uh, no regulation guideline to allow uh, the treated wastewater treated such a high quality that can irrigate on the food crop consumed by human directly, such as tomato, strawberry. So that guideline is there, but uh, there are also another three class of water can be reused, irrigate on the crop. A uh, crop like soybean, like uh, uh, corn, you had to process before human can consume. And, you know, the, the corn do have the, the skin to protect same as uh, uh, soybean. So that water quality is not as uh, high compared with the class four, which is directly you can apply on the food crop. So as, as I say, my time, 90% time is to do with the water and maybe 5% to food or 5% to energy. Thank you. Um, so it sounds like for our farmers that, I like that there is no typical day. I'm gonna use that actually in my life. Um, but but it sounds like it's just hard work that there's a lot that comes up a lot with economics with uh, finances and then um, from our friends at our regulatory agencies it sounds like there's a real emphasis on just making sure that the water that we are reusing really is safe so I think hearing all that um, I'm going to go off my script a little bit based on what what you're saying so my my last question for you and then I'm going to open it up to everyone in the audience um, is having all of these researchers and students in the audience, what is it that we can do as a research community that would help you be successful? Oh, well, so um, one thing I've discussed is uh, water testing. So I, my, my system's a, a recirculating um, reservoir system. So I can't really afford to have the water tested. Um, so a lot of it, a lot of the, um, how I treat the water, I mean, the water's treated with UV light, it's treated with uh, hydrogen peroxide. I measure the ORP levels. Um, I measure the EC, the pH, all that stuff, but I don't really know what is the contents of the, of the reservoir. So that would be something that's very helpful, um, sort of maximizing the healthy. If I knew the, 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 the contents of the actual reservoir, I'd be able to sort of maximize the growth more. Um, that's the main one I'm thinking of right now. Uh, I don't have any. As I say, I think the uh, regulatory agency, the regulated water quality is safe for human use. And uh, as a researcher uh, uh, in in a university, uh, if you uh, can develop uh, a cost effective uh, any uh, technology to make the water quality uh, a pure and then also the, uh, less costly, that would be uh, really helpful in helping the uh, water reuse industry. Thank you. Well, I, I think there are a number of things that you can do. I'd say that it starts with visiting us. We would love to have um, researchers and students come see our operation. We, As I said, we have three farms now. And um, we would like you to come see what we do and help us figure out next steps and what we need to learn, what we need to improve. Um, we do have a number of research projects going, one with the um, university, with the um, State of Maryland um, Department of Agriculture, where we are researching soil health and we are using, we, we create, um, vermicompost with hundreds of thousands of worms. And we are trying to compare some of the growth that we have um, been able to monitor with, with direct compost and with vermicompost. Um, there, there are many things about water quality that we would like to make sure we are um, working with and trying to convince um, legislators that we can reuse water and that we have some standards for what healthy water looks like. Um, 
the, those of you who work on policy change, there are many, many arenas where um, before we were able to even start farming, because people told me I would never ever be able to build a hoop house in Prince George's County. We had to do a lot of policy changes and um, we helped create something called the Food Equity Council. I would love some of you to serve on that and on other agricultural um, organ uh, commissions and so on in the county and state so that we can actually create policy that cares about people and healthy food. Um, and, um, you know, this, this question that Dominic raised about, um, how do we create viable and, um, economically viable small systems for, um, for producing food, whether we do it cooperatively or so on. Um, he had mentioned that, you know, that the big companies are all subsidized and the little ones are out there struggling by themselves and trying to figure out how to make it work. So we need your economic expertise and your advocacy as well to try to figure out how we can subsidize small farmers and make sure there are small farmers because that's where the learning takes place. 